One of the most prominent characters in the Bible is this guy named Apostle Paul. He wrote the majority of the New Testament. But if you've been reading through the book of Acts, you'll note that his name was originally Saul, or so you think it was. Now, there's a common misconception amongst Christians about his name change, and that is the fact that there is actually no name change. I mean, I've heard people mention that Saul was his before Jesus name, and now Paul, now that he's a Christian, is his new name. Well, that's not the case. Because as it turns out, both Saul and Paul are names that were given to him at birth. Yeah, it was pretty common in those days, especially if you're a Jewish person who was born outside of Israel, to have both a Jewish and a Gentile name. So Saul, being born in a place called Tarsus, which is outside of Israel, had a Jewish name, Shaul, which is Saul in English, and also a Roman name, Paulus, or Paul. So there was no name change. It's just that he went from his Jewish given name to his Gentile given name. But this brings up a really interesting question because you see the author of the book of Acts, which is Luke. Um, so why did he wait until chapter 13 to introduce to us his Gentile name? I mean, like everywhere else where a new character is introduced, they tell us both names at that point. Like, for example, there's a guy by the name of Joseph. And Luke immediately tells us that his other name is Justice, or Tabitha, which is quickly paired with the name Dorcas in chapter 9. And in chapter 12, John, he's given another name, which is Mark. So it seems quite common for biblical authors to give us both names when they're introducing a character. So why did Luke introduce to us Saul in chapter 7 of Acts, and then introduce us to his Gentile name in chapter 13, verse 9? So in the very beginning of chapter 13, when he is still called Saul, we find out that Saul goes to an island called Cyprus. And there he's invited to meet the most important person on that island, a proconsul by the name of Sergius Paulus. Then it says that Saul's teachings, which the intelligent Sergius Paulus listened to, caused him to become a Jesus follower. And in the middle of that story, Luke introduces to us to Saul's other name, which is Paul. And from here on out, in the book of Acts, Luke only refers to him as Paul. Okay, but if you're listening very carefully, you might have picked up on something interesting here. The name of the proconsul is Sergius Paulus. The name of Saul's Gentile name is also Paulus. I mean, we call him Paul, but the original language says Paulus. The proconsul and the apostle has the exact same name. Then, in the very next story, we're still in chapter 13, we discover that Paul is in a synagogue giving a Jewish history lesson. Now, I want you to keep this in mind. When most people in the Bible, like when they're retelling a shortened version of Jewish history, they usually skip the parts that are shameful and not important. But in Paul's retelling the story, he includes a character from the Old Testament that is often skipped. He brings up an Old Testament king by the name of Saul. You see, King Saul is often skipped because he's known as a king that failed. I mean, people are more interested in the king that came after him, which is King David. But Paul does it anyways. Included in his version of Jewish history, King Saul makes an appearance, and Luke, for some odd reason, decides to point that out by recording that for us. Well, in his essay on this very topic, scholar Stephen B. Chapman of Duke Divinity School, well, he makes a really interesting point. He argues that Paul was very much aware that he had a very similar life as King Saul of the Old Testament. Like, for example, they were both called Saul, and they both came from the tribe of Benjamin. Another thing is that they're both part of a chosen group of Israel. I mean, King Saul was a king, and Saul, or Paul, was a Pharisee. Or another thing is that they both acted rashly, being carried away by anger, which led to persecution of God's new chosen people. Like in King Saul's case, out of his anger, he tried to kill King David. And here, Paul, he, out of his anger, he tries to kill Christians. So they have a lot in common, but there's also some huge differences between the two, and that's what Luke is trying to point out here. You see, when Paul encounters Jesus, he repents right away and becomes a champion of the very people he persecuted. See, Saul, he never repented, and it drove him down into this very chaotic life, and eventually it led to his defeat. And Luke really wanted to differentiate his Saul in this story from the Saul of the Old Testament. Okay, so let me put it another way. Saul just met a proconsul on the island of Cyprus. The proconsul is a very powerful person. He's not quite the king, that's Caesar, but beneath him, he is the most important person on that island. So he's kind of like a king. So there's a King Paulus in the island of Cyprus, and then back in Israel in the Old Testament, there was a King Saul. 
And here, Saul of Tarsus is standing at a crossroads. On one hand, the road leads to an identity associated with the failed King Saul of Israel, and the other is a Gentile proconsul he just met who was extremely open and willing to accept the message and implications of following Jesus. He intentionally places his story between the encounter he had with the proconsul Paulus and him talking about King Saul. So, what does this mean for us? Well, perhaps you are at a crossroads too. Your pride would much rather take Saul's road, which will eventually lead to your demise like it did for King Saul. But Jesus would much rather have you humble yourself like the proconsul Sergius Paulus did, which led him to a life of following Jesus. So the big question that Luke might be asking you is, will you be like King Saul, rejecting God's anointed king? Or will you be like Sergius Paulus, accepting the anointed king? The choice is yours.